spring, brothers and sisters. My name is Pastor Harry, if we haven't met, and I am the youth pastor here at the village, and I am honored to be bringing you God's word this morning. And I'm excited to see the ways that God is going to continue moving this morning. It's been amazing to watch and see the ways that God is moving in this church. I hear stories every single week of people's lives being transformed by Jesus. People getting baptized in our traditional service, through our connect groups, God's moving in our sports and interest groups, in our young adult service, and people getting baptized across every age group. Our kids ministry, we just had Splash Fest this past week, and 10 kids got baptized at Splash Fest. And there's more baptisms coming today, and if you guys wanna get baptized, we can make that happen today too, so talk to a pastor. But I get to see so many cool things that God is doing in the lives of our students as well. I see students who are taking their faith more seriously. Students who are being vulnerable, confessing sins, being open about their weakness, seeking wisdom, growing in their relationships. And I love being a youth pastor. It's, it's what God called me to do, and sometimes it's really fun. I mean, just a little over a week ago, we got to go to Hershey Park. It's one of my favorite work days. There's chocolate, there's a water park, there's two hours of a bus ride there and back that we get to talk and build relationships. There's roller coasters, it's everything you would want. And it's still a work day, I still gotta make sure everyone is uh, there where they need to be, make sure everyone's safe and no one gets into trouble. But it's still one of the best work days. And I remember that while we were there, things did go really great. People showed up to our meeting places on time. Nobody was missing. I think everyone had a really great time. There were no serious injuries. I think the worst was like a sunburn and some burned feet from walking around barefoot. And by the end, there were no lines for the roller coasters. So you just walk straight onto them. It was incredible. And I'm confident that part of the reason that it went well, part of the reason that everyone was safe and everyone had a good time was because that's what I prayed for. As soon as we got onto the bus, I got everyone to quiet down and I prayed, God, would you give us safe travels on our way there and on our way back? Would you help us have the most fun we've ever had on a Hershey trip? And God, would you remind us when we're supposed to meet and help us to meet there on time? And praise God, all of that happened. And I think that's how a lot of our prayers sound. The prayer is like, God, help me. God. Bless me, God, heal this person. God, help me finish this project for work on time. God, give us safe travels. And one of my personal prayers uh, used to be, God, would you teach me patience? But don't teach me patience by putting difficult people in my life. <laughs> God, teach me patience, but don't teach me through experience. Just give me extra patience. And God did answer my prayer, and I did grow in patience, but that was like an extra safe prayer. Like, God, I want to learn this lesson, but I want to learn it the easy way. Give it to me the easy way. And today we're talking about asking God for wisdom that can only be learned the hard way, only learned the uncomfortable way. And we're calling it Dangerous Prayers. And that concept is from a book by Craig Groeschel called Dangerous Prayers, and I'm really only gonna scratch the surface of three dangerous prayers. So if you're interested in looking for more, check out Craig Groeschel's book on it. So these prayers, they are dangerous because they're prayers of war. It's flesh versus spirit. Prayers that make you take the next step in your faith. And before we look at our first prayer, I wanna say that these prayers, they're not like a requirement. There's no command in the Bible that says, pray these three prayers. But I'm going to challenge you to pray them. And our first one comes from Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. It says, search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. So this prayer, it's asking God to search our hearts, to reveal hidden sins, weaknesses, areas that need transformation. It's a prayer of self-examination and repentance, inviting God in to reveal truths about ourselves 
even when it's uncomfortable. So let's break it down into three, no, sorry, four parts. Part one, search me. Know my heart. We need to know and understand where our hearts are because we want to be people like David who are called a man after God's own heart. And that's part of what this prayer is about. It's aligning our hearts with God. To do that, we need to know what's going on in our hearts so that we can fix it. So what's the Bible say about our heart? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful. Above all things, beyond cure, who could understand it? So apparently we got some bad hearts, some lying, deceitful hearts. And if I had to guess, the person that our hearts deceive the most is probably ourselves. Like, oh, we're not that bad. We try to do the right thing. We love people. We give to those in need. And I'm a good person. And the heart is going to lie, 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 lie. Because the truth of the scripture is that nobody without Jesus, no one is righteous, not even one. No one's a good person apart from him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Our good deeds don't make us good. Only Jesus can. So with our hearts trying to trick us, trying to fight this spirit versus flesh war, we need God to search our hearts. Because there might be things hidden in there that we didn't even realize with God were wrong. So in the beginning of our walk with God, we like to fix these big things that are going on, these big problems that we have, and then we get to work on the little things. We're thinking like, hmm, why did I have that tone in that conversation? Why am I not loving that person like Jesus? Why do I think that I'm better than those sinners over there? And I already mentioned one of the things that I realized about myself was that I needed to work on my patience because I was short with people. And another thing that God revealed to me as I prayed this prayer was the way that I made jokes. I made jokes at the expense of other people. I would put them down for the sake of a laugh and God convicted me about it. And instead I learned and I practiced to replace that with the gift of encouragement. But my heart, you know, it was lying to me that whole time. It was saying it's fine. It's just a joke. It's not that serious. It's not that deep. But for those people that I was putting down, it was serious. It was a big deal. And I think that as we grow, we find that those little things, they actually are the big things. So search me, God. And the next line in this passage, know my anxious thoughts. Part of this prayer is to reveal fears. What is it that you're anxious about? Do you leave the garage door open this morning? The front door unlocked? Are you anxious about failure, the unknown, the future, finances, losing someone that you love? Well, here's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And I love how Pastor Craig says this line. What we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. What we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. And when we pray this, God is going to reveal things that we don't even know about ourselves. Because those biggest lies, they're the ones that we tell ourselves. And the third part of this prayer, point out anything in me that offends you. So we're good at pointing out sin. We just like to point it out in other people. We like to see other people's failures. We accuse others and we excuse ourselves. So what are the things that you've rationalized? Oh, it's just a joke. It's not that serious. There's no real harm. Where are you the most defensive? I don't need to work on my patience. They need to work on not being so annoying. Because when you pray this dangerous prayer, God's going to point out those things that you've rationalized. He's going to point out those things that you've denied. And this prayer is going to point you to your need for Christ. And then you get to go to Jesus for that need because only he can meet it. And there is grace. And that's why the prayer ends with, lead me. Lead me in the way of everlasting life. We say, God, I only want to live for you. I want your way, not mine. Show me where I'm wrong and show me how to live right. So that is dangerous prayer number one. Search me. Our second dangerous prayer is break me. 
break me. And this comes from like the entirety of Psalm 51, but we're just going to focus in on verse 8. It says, you have broken me, now let me rejoice. You know, it's dangerous to ask God to break you. And we might be tempted to think that if we pray this, then we get to see incredible things happen. We get to see miracles take place, that we'll be blessed for praying this, that we immediately get to the other side that says, now let me rejoice. But the truth is that when you pray this, what's going to happen is God is going to break you. He's going to break our pride, our self-reliance, our self-sufficiency. It's an acknowledgement of our need for God's work in our lives, even if it involves breaking down our self-centeredness and our ego. It's asking God to show us our human weakness and show us his strength. And these weaknesses, that's often how we connect with other people. That's how we relate to other people. And you guys know this, we, we impress people with our strengths, the things that we're good at, but we connect through our weaknesses. And sometimes we even hate people for their strengths, like, oh, she's so perfect. She's so nice, I hate her. And then we realize, like, oh, that person's insecure too. Oh, that person has struggles too. No, I, I kind of like them now. We impress with our strengths we connect through our weaknesses. And I see that in TV too. There's those morally perfect characters that always do the right thing and they're not really relatable. It's those people that have internal struggles, that struggle to make the right decision, that have battles between right and wrong. Those are the ones that we connect with and relate with. So be open about your weakness because that is how we can connect with others when we are breaking. And here's the great thing about breaking. Another line from Pastor Craig, he says, life's greatest breakings often lead to God's greatest blessings. An example we see of this in scripture is Peter. As he denies Jesus three times, and that third time, he's looking at Jesus in his eyes and he denies him, and Peter breaks. He breaks before his God. And then after this, he was this speaker at Pentecost. He was the guy that got the keys to heaven. And we see this also in Mark 14, verse 3. It says, while Jesus was at Bethany, reclining at a table at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume made of pure nard. And she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. She broke and poured. In a little context for this passage, this woman was a well-known prostitute in the community. And we later learn that that perfume was worth a year's wages. So think about how much money you make in a year. Get that number. And that is what she is pouring out onto Jesus. And the disciples saw this, and they were looking at the value of that perfume, saying, oh my goodness, don't do that. We could sell it. We could feed so many hungry people. And to be honest, that's what I was thinking when I was reading this passage. Oh my goodness, there's so much more that could be done. But Jesus saw that there were more to her actions. He saw beyond the surface because that perfume, that was also a part of her job. See, in that day, people couldn't really afford perfume and it was very, very expensive. And it was really just the prostitutes that used it as a signal to men to say, hey, I'm working, I'm available. And that perfume was also her savings, right? A year's worth of wages saved up in that bottle. And so in this woman's actions, see, she is saying, God, take my past, take the ways I used to live, and take my future, everything I have saved. I give it all to you. She was broken and poured out. And so if you are in the midst of breaking and everything is crumbling around you, I challenge you, fall on the rock and break. Admit that you need God, the support of the people around you. God, break me of me, break me of sin. I give you my past and I give you my future. And I'm confident that there's a large number of people who would say that we follow Jesus, but we're not fully devoted to it. We're partially devoted people. We do it when it's convenient. Because right now, it's, it's easy to say I'm your follower. Right now, it's easy to live for you. I don't have people pressuring me to live a different way, to go down a different path. Right now, it's easy to give a tithe. 
But when it's hard, we leave it, partially devoted. And if that's you, consider praying this dangerous prayer. God, break me so that I can be fully dependent on you. Whatever it takes, God, I want to know you intimately, to serve you faithfully. I trust you, so whatever it takes, break me. And I prayed this prayer in 2023, and God did break me. He broke me of my self-reliance. He brought me to a point where I had no choice but to rely on his strength. And every day I prayed, God, would you give me the strength to accomplish this task? God, would you give me the strength to love this person the way you would? God, would you give me the strength to lead? And I learned to rely on the strength of God. And I know that sounds like obvious and it sounds cheesy, rely on the strength of God. But I learned to do it in new ways that I couldn't have if I didn't go through brokenness. So God, continue to break me. Build me up in your image. And third, our last prayer is a prayer of availability. Send me. Like I said, most of our prayers, they're, they're for ourselves. They're for our loved ones. Like, God, would you give me this promotion? Would you help me in this conversation I'm going to have? Would you provide the finances necessary for this thing? Would you have favor on me and my family? God, would you give me wisdom? And these are great prayers. There's nothing wrong with these prayers. But that's the safe way to pray. The dangerous way to pray is to say, God, what could I do for you? And that prayer can transform your life. It is a blank check on your life. And God might lead you to a different job, to a different country, to a different relationship, to use your finances differently, because God calls those who know him into new things. And when he does, there's three ways that we can respond. One, we could be like Jonah. Jonah says, here I am, I'm not going. Jonah 1, verse 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh, preach against it, because its wickedness has come up against me. But Jonah ran from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. And we've probably felt something similar. We felt God calling us to do something, and we say, I'm here, but not today, God. I'm not willing to do that, though. And a week ago, I was driving through Baltimore, and there was a homeless man at the gas station I stopped at asking for money. And God said, give him some money and pray for him. And so I went inside. I did what I needed to do. I got back to my car, and the car behind me had just finished filling up their tank, and they put the handle back. And the way that this gas station was laid out, there's no way for them to, like, back up and move around me. They had to wait for me to move through. And so I grabbed some money out of my car. I grabbed some food, and I walked over to the guy, and I gave it to him. I said, Jesus loves you. God bless. And I got back in my car, and I drove off so that car could get through. And now I missed something that God told me to do. He said, pray with that man. But, man, there was a line of cars waiting for me to move. I had to get home. I had to rest for the next day. It just didn't work. Now, I could have made it work, but instead, I made excuses. Are my weaknesses connecting with you? Have you ever felt that way before? That sometimes we don't want to do exactly what God asks us to do. Well, Moses had a different response. Option number two to respond to God's leading. Moses says, here I am. Send someone else. Exodus 3.10, verse 10 through 11. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Yeah, who am I that I should do this? I'm not the right person. Send Aaron instead. He's a better speaker than me. We make excuses like this too. God says, give a tenth of our income to the storehouse, but who am I to give to you? Look at them over there. They have more money. Ask them to do it. I don't have time to serve you. Look at them. They have more free time. Ask them. I'm not good enough to do that, God. That person is much more talented than me. Who am I that I should do this? Man, who am I to think that God couldn't use me in spite of my weakness? Who am I to think that with what little I gave to God, he could not do immeasurably more? At the heart of it, 
Moses was not doubting his own power, his own abilities. He was doubting the power of God to work through him. And so the last way to respond is to pray a dangerous prayer that Isaiah prays. He says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. And I want to point out what Isaiah didn't say. He didn't say, Hey, what's the climate like where you're sending me? Where are you sending me? Do they get to experience all four seasons there? Because that's kind of important for me. What's the cost of living and the benefits and the pay range? He said, here I am, send me. And this prayer is a commitment to be used by God for a positive impact in the world. It's asking us to, send, to have God send us into places, situations where we can serve, share his love, make an impact for his kingdom, even if it means going beyond our comfort zone. And this was my prayer in college. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I was looking for a new major. So I prayed, God, here I am, send me. Send me somewhere, give me some direction. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. And so he called me into ministry and he opened up door after door. He sent me to Texas, to Indiana, to Maryland, to Pennsylvania to do his work. So what do you need to fully surrender to God? Where you get to that point where you write the blank check on your life to say, here I am, send me. I'm gonna give you three ideas to help with this. Three things that are helpful for a life fully surrendered to God. One, a genuine experience with the presence of God. So we're gonna look at the beginning of Isaiah chapter six, and we're gonna look at what led up to that moment where he said, here I am, send me. Verse one, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This text, text talks about Isaiah seeing angels, seraphim, praising and worshiping God. Isaiah had a real experience in the presence of God, and it transformed him. So why might you not be available to God? Perhaps it's because you haven't recently experienced his presence. So you need to experience the presence of God. And God is everywhere. He is omnipresent, so it doesn't take much to recognize his presence. It's really just an acknowledgement that he is already with us. It's a refocusing of our minds, not on the chaos of the world around us and the things that are stressing us, but to bring our focus to him. For me, it happens a lot on my car rides, listening to beautiful music, appreciating the nature around me, watching a bug and seeing the way God sustains its existence and considering how much more he loves me. It's here at church with a community of believers worshiping him. In his word, in my prayers, there are so many ways to focus and recognize the presence of God. Second thing we need, a genuine awareness of our sinfulness. We need a genuine awareness of our sinfulness. And I've already said, I think one of the most common lies we hear today is I'm a good person, they're a good person, she's a good person, but that is a lie. We are riding in our sin terrible, horrible, nasty people, the worst of sinners. Welcome to church where we make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> but that's who we are. That's who we are apart from Jesus. I am wicked, you are wicked. And Isaiah, he saw the goodness of God and in comparison realized how far from it he was. And the closer we get to God, the more I think we can sympathize with Paul when he says, I am the worst of sinners. This is how Isaiah said it in verse five. Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So what does it take to get to a place where you're genuinely surrendered? To come to that place where you say, here I am, send me. Genuine experience in God's presence, genuine awareness of our sinfulness, and third, a genuine understanding of God's grace. When we have these things, it brings us to a place of complete surrender. Isaiah 6, verse 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, 
and your sins atoned for. Isaiah recognized all of his wickedness in one encounter with God. And then Isaiah experienced forgiveness. His guilt was taken away. His sin was atoned for. And we experience that same forgiveness. Lies forgiven. Lust forgiven. Outburst of anger forgiven. Hidden sins forgiven. And God separates those sins as far as the east is from the west. And when we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. When you see and understand God's grace, it is transformative. Isaiah was touched by the coal and we are touched and washed by the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. So when we experience God's presence, the depth of our sin and the overwhelming grace of God, our only reasonable response is total surrender. Surrender of everything. Here I am, send me. Broken and poured out. And that's a daily decision. It's not a one-time thing like, hey, I prayed that prayer and now I'm all set. It's daily because once you follow Jesus, you have that new spirit in you. But God tells us that our flesh, like our desires, our will, our way, that's at war with our spirit. And that's why we say things like, here I am, I don't want to go. Here I am, send someone else. I know you asked me to do it, but that's not part of my five-step plan for my life that I've already mapped out. Your spirit wants you to do what God wants you to do. Here I am, send me. So how do we get better at having this spirit win over the flesh? It's pretty simple, but it's not easy. And I'm going to give you a saying from our Bible study for high schoolers called Feed the Dogs. This is what it says. Inside me there are two dogs, one mean and evil, the other good. They fight each other all the time, and when asked which one wins, I answer, the one I feed the most. So if we feed our flesh, gimme, 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 I'm gonna do what I wanna do. My time's too important. Someone else can do that. I love Jesus, but I'm not doing that for him. Then the flesh wins. Or if we feed the spirit, we participate in church life. We become a part of a connect group. We find places to use our gifts and our talents for God's kingdom. We meditate on his word day and night. We talk to God. I'm in the church and I am the church. Then we feed the spirit. The spirit grows stronger. I become available to God. And now that I'm available to God, God's asked me to do these things. And sometimes we look around and wonder, like, why does God have some people do so many things? Well, it's because they're faithful. And whoever is faithful with little, God will trust with much. So we feed the good and we kill the bad daily. We experience God's overwhelming presence. We recognize our own sinfulness. And then we genuinely see God's grace. And that makes us able to say, here I am, send me. A life fully surrendered to God. So why are more Jesus followers not praying these prayers? Well, I think it comes from a place of fear. Because search me, that's a dangerous prayer. Break me, that's a scary thing to pray. Send me, man, that's a risky prayer. I think that we fear that God is going to have us do something that we don't want to do. Like, go be a missionary, sell everything you own, go to a place that doesn't have McDonald's and flushable toilets. Oh, terrifying. And that might happen. But what I think is more likely is that God is going to use you here. God is going to send you as a missionary to your coworkers. And that's dangerous. You might get fired for talking about Jesus. Not as dangerous as being executed like you would in some places. But if finances is the thing you fear the most, man, that's really dangerous for you. That's really scary. I think it's more likely that God is going to call you to serve the people right in front of you. To use you where you already are. To be faithful with the opportunities you already have. To invite your neighbors to church. To buy the groceries of the mom behind you at the grocery store. To listen and be there for the person that's hurting and be the love of Jesus for them. To lead a connect group. To give beyond your tithe. To serve with a bunch of crazy second graders. It's often not some big, grand adventure that God sends us on. It's the little things, the daily things that we can do. 
And really, they're not little. They're not little to the people that you're helping. They're not little to God. Your faithfulness to listen to God's call is never a small thing in his eyes. It's a big deal. And when you're faithful with the opportunities that you have now, God will trust you with more. And then excitement can build in you, but you become expectant. How is God going to move through me today? Who is God going to help through me today? Because you're available. And I've made a little saying that helps me live this out, and I say it in my head as a reminder to myself. Whenever God asks me to do something, I immediately reply, yes, Lord. Go back into the store, buy those people's school supplies. Give money to that person. Tell them about my love. Ask how you can pray for that woman. And I already told you guys that I'm not perfect at it. Sometimes I still give excuses why I shouldn't listen. And it's awkward to go up to a stranger. They're probably fine. Was that really God prompting me to do that? Uh, they look busy. I don't want to interrupt. It's dangerous to say, here I am, send me. Because God will. And it's not always comfortable and easy. But on the other side of these dangerous prayers is a life changed, a life transformed, formed more into the image of God. So let's review these three prayers. I'm going to have them up on the screens for you guys. So our first one, search me. Heavenly Father, as hard as it is for me, I ask you to search me. Search me, God, know my heart. Test my motives, reveal my anxious thoughts. Show me anything in me that offends you. God, I want to see you in me, to, for you to show me the weaknesses I have. God, as hard as it is to ask, search me. Break me. God, I know you give grace to the humble, so I ask you, God, do a deep work in my heart and break me. Break me of my pride, break me of my selfishness, break me of anything that keeps me from knowing you. And as hard as it is to ask, God, do whatever it takes to break me. And last, send me. God, I know you want to use me to show your love in this world. Give me the eyes to see the needs of others and a heart that dares to get involved where you are working. God, my life is yours. Whatever you want, wherever you lead, here I am, send me. I'm not sure if any of these prayers stuck out to you. Maybe all of them did. But if God highlighted one of these in your mind, I challenge you, pray it every day this week. And start that prayer this morning. We got our altars set up in the front. And if you are someone who is willing to pray one of these prayers, would you just get up and make your way to the altar to say, hey, I am going to pray this. I am going to start this dangerous journey for God. And if that's you, go ahead and start making your way up. Get on your knees before God in prayer. And as people do, I'm going to leave us with a saying that our intern John left us, said to me last week. He said, when trouble comes, are you going to be a person that falls into your habits? Are you going to be a person that falls to your knees. Let's be a people that fall to our knees before God. So if you're willing to pray one of these dangerous prayers, as we worship, come on up. Meet God at these altars. And let's worship together. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got a lot out of it. If you feel like you need to respond, you can visit fairviewvillagechurch.com prayer and you can fill out the forms there and let us know how we can be praying for you. Or you can scan the QR code below and that'll take you everywhere you need to go for next steps. Thanks so much for joining. We hope you have a great week and looking forward to connecting with you.